I got into extinction, the subject of extinction, because of relativity. Because all the mathematical physicists out there, physicists being with quotation, uh, they believe we're going to live forever. You know, we're, we're going to get out of the planet, uh, at least if you ask the people at NASA, right? They're, they're investigating all this stuff out there, how to travel to Mars, and from there on maybe to the nearest star, you know, the Alpha Centauri system out there. And yeah, and then we're probably going to expand to the galaxy, throughout the galaxy, and have all these level one, level two, and level three uh, civilizations. What the hell is all of that? I'm saying we're about to become extinct here, folks. <laughs> we're at the end of the line, and these people are talking about the future. There ain't no future. And so we start out with uh, extinction, and a fellow yesterday pointed, out, pointed me into the direction of an article that was written by, um, uh, he's an editor of, uh, what is it, of Nature, and he wrote the article in uh, Scientific American. And his name is G, or, or I, I think that's how he pronounces his name, G, or like in McGee, uh, maybe G. I'm going to call him G, like G whiz. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the fellow. Okay. And he wrote it, uh, wrote in Scientific American, humans are doomed to go extinct. Yes, he got that one right. <laughs> no doubt about We're about to go extinct. And he says the following, uh, a paleo uh, well, this is his title. He's a paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, and editor at Nature. And he wrote this piece for Scientific American. And right off the bat, he says, habitat degradation, low genetic variation, declining fertility are setting Homo sapiens up for collapse which is what I've been saying for the last 20 years. Okay, I've written extensively about that. I've got uh, videos on that. Um, you know, the whole works. Uh, he, it's almost like he took all this from my book, uh, Why God Doesn't Exist. Okay, and so I applaud the man. He, he got those right. And he goes into a little more detail here. He says the following, and again, uh, matches everything I've been saying. He starts out with what we call in rational science as statement of the facts. Okay, these are not facts. They are his personal beliefs or his personal assumptions on which he's going to base his theory. They're known as statements of the facts under rational science. In other words, they are not facts. They are just what he's going to start his theory with. Okay, And so he says humans have been inbreeding for over 300,000 years and have ended up with little genetic diversity. By the way, these are my summaries of his arguments. These are not verbal, uh, textual things that he said. Uh, and we have both see eye to eye on this. Yeah, we've been around for 300,000 years, and we ended up with little genetic diversity. And I'm saying that's because of inbreeding. Okay. Uh, next uh, main point, uh, since the 1960s, population has more than doubled, whereas sperm quality has declined, possibly due to pollution and stress. Other than the pollution and stress, we see eye to eye on that issue as well. But the birth rate has declined in great measure due to women's emancipation, and global population will reach its zenith in mid-century. Okay, and uh, here you see uh, these are the growth rate, population growth rates. Okay, and what they tell us is that, yeah, if, we, if everything stays the way it is until now, uh, we're going to end up with, um, you know, with uh, a, a zenith, in other words, a maximum population sometime around this uh, century. And, and the numbers now point to around mid-century. Okay, and... Um, Okay, and let me go with his conclusions then. Uh, well, uh, let me finish that other one there. Economic growth is unsustainable. Totally in agreement. Where we disagree is in this last statement, because resources are finite. That's just going to be his argument. Okay, and yeah, there we have a big problem. It has nothing to do with the finiteness of resources. Okay. And uh, so his conclusions are something like this. The cause of extinction is usually a delayed reaction to habitat loss. Absolutely not. And habitat becomes degraded. There are few re fewer resources to go around. And again, I'm going to say absolutely not. Okay, so we disagree completely on that. Our theories diverge at this point. Okay, let me get this out of here. Give me a second here. Okay, so uh, what's my argument on this? Well, I'm saying it's got nothing to do with resources. Uh, are there finite resources on the planet? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if population keeps increasing, will be will we consume those resources? Resources will be will we exhaust them? We don't even need to grow. I mean, if we leave the population stable as it is as it is now, eight billion people, right? Uh, and we just consume, 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 and leave even the population more or less, you know, fixed or constant. 
we're going to eventually uh, get rid of most of the resources on the planet. But a lot of that has to do with a person I essentially dislike <laughs> that I don't agree with in just about anything, but I'll have to agree with this on him, and that's Milton Friedman. And his notion against all Malthusians who said, you know, population doubles every uh, 25 years and we're going to outstrip resources. Here I'll have to agree with Mr. Friedman. And, and that is the Chicago School of Economics. And what he said is that, you know, it's a question of money. You know, if you want to draw water out of the center of the Sahara Desert, it's an issue of money. Someone will do it for the right amount of money. They'll go out to the Sahara Desert and they'll draw water from the center of the earth if necessary. Uh, resources is a question of money, but yeah, there are finite resources. I'm not sure you can take uh, Friedman's argument to an extreme. There are, there is a point at which you outstrip resources. But my point here is that that's going to be way beyond the extinction of man. Man's extinction will become will come much sooner than, than the stripping of resources. Same with climate change. Climate change does climate change? Yeah, it's always changed. I don't know a single day in the history of life on Earth where uh, climate has not changed. And did that cause the extinction of species or anything like that? And I'm saying absolutely not. Climate changes and, uh, uh, you know, it's very slow. <laughs> uh, climate is, is a very slow process. And so we don't have to worry about all these nuts out there who talk about climate change because it's got nothing to do with nothing, absolutely anything. It has no bearing on anything. Does climate change? Yeah, it changes. But it works so slowly that human extinction will beat climate change when it becomes important, you know, and relevant, it would beat them by a mile. Human extinction is right around the corner. Okay? Is it because of resources? Is it because of climate? Is it because of disease? Is it because of an asteroid is going to hit us on the head? Is it going to be because some volcano is going to erupt? Is it going to be because some supernova is going to wipe us out like in the Ordovician? No, absolutely not. Uh, mass extinctions never occurred because of catastrophic accidents. It's, uh, again, the religion of mathematics, okay, that penetrated um, paleontology, specifically with Mr. Luis, Luis Alvarez, and he, he made it famous, this asteroid theory, right, uh, 1980s. And even before him, you had, uh, you know, people who talked about that all the way to George Cuvier in the uh, late 18th uh, century. They already thought about, you know, some extraterrestrial impact. This was nothing new. The only thing that Louis proposed is, or came up with is what is important to the mathematicians and not to science. And that's proof, evidence, persuasion, conversion, you know, recruiting. That's what it was all about because mathematicians uh, emphasize recruiting, proof, evidence. And proof, evidence have not, has nothing to do with science. It has to do with religion, with persuading you to change your mind, to change your way of thinking. That's what a prosecutor does. Science is not like law. You don't go to the jury and try to persuade them and convince them. We do anyway because it's human nature. But that portion of your presentation has to be seen as religion. Science is objective. We explain a theory so that you understand it. Once you understand it, that's the end of science. What continues is religion, belief, opinion, voting, you know, raising your hand. That's religion. And so mathematicians, you know, they emphasize proof and evidence. And that was what the asteroid theory was all about. And so, yeah, um, here's a big picture of how mass extinctions happen. And I always emphasize that you've got to do extinction uh, 101 before you do extinction 102. What is extinction 102? It's human extinction. And first, before you do human extinction, you have to know something about extinction. You have to go to kindergarten extinction uh, class and learn something about extinction. You can't just jump to human extinction and say, oh, I, I know how man's going to become extinct or how he will not become extinct. No, first you got to go to Extinction 101 and find out what that's all about. And so here's Extinction 101 from my point of view. Okay, This is the objective theory of how uh, extinctions happen, mass extinctions. Okay, I'm going to talk only about mass extinctions. Okay, And here, uh, pic uh, what picture is worth a thousand words? Okay, What you have is different types of plants that govern millions of years uh, in th these different epochs or ages or whatever. And uh, so you have uh, primarily there, we'll see the seed ferns in the, day, in the days of the Permian and the Triassic. You have the age of gymnosper uh, gymnosperms, or um, you can call them conifers, in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. And today we live in the age of angiosperms. We're the age of mammals. And you can see what happened here. If you were standing at the beginning of the Cambrian, 
542 million years ago? Well, you would look forward, and what you would see is that when the ferns disappeared, well, the you know the mammal-like reptiles disappeared, and when the uh, especially the cycads, because Jurassic was known as the age of cycads. But when the conifers disappeared, the dinosaurs disappeared. And guess what's going to happen when the <laughs> angiosperms disappear, especially the angiosperms we eat, because we don't eat all angiosperms. Okay? Well, then we disappear. Okay? So the mass extinctions are caused by uh, the uh, disappearance of a food chain. And so here we have the definitions, okay? And the first one is the, the one on the top. That's going to be a, not a uh, mass extinction, but a background extinction. If you look up the word uh, background extinction, the term background extinction, you won't find a definition. What you'll find is the background extinction rate. What is rate? Mathematics. Again, they talk about math. They want to put math at all into uh, science at all points. We don't need the rate. I need to know why one species disappeared all by itself. For example, the Neanderthals. You know, how did they disappear? Well, we have the brains at the Max Planck Institute, and they say because they married with us, they, they interbred with us. Boy, that would have probably saved humans. You know, we would have had more genetic diversity. But no, uh, we, we never had sex with the Neanderthals, and I've written extensively about that. Uh, no, they died because their population pyramid overturned. And for what this uh, uh, gentleman, uh, G, uh, Henry G, I think, um, uh, proposed, and that's that we've inter we've been inbreeding, not interbreeding, but inbreeding, and the Neanderthal Neanderthals were inbreeding for thousands of years, and at the end, they lost their genetic diversity, and above all, their population pyramid overturned, and that's the mechanism of a background extinction. What is a background extinction? Not the rate, but a background extinction. It's the disappearance of one species, how one this species disappears all by itself. But see, the mathematicians talk about all those um, uh, species that die in the background. And so they, they, they're concerned about the rate, but they never focus on the mechanism. Why does a species disappear all by itself? What happened to it? And so again, they, they don't do physics, they do math. They call it the rate, and that's why we don't have a, a, a definition for the term background extinction. And then uh, how, how about a mass extinction, which is what we participate in, humans? Okay, and again, it's the overturning of the ecological pyramid. What happens is a mass extinction is what? Disappearance of a food chain. It has something to do with food. That's the way Mother Nature does mass extinctions. Okay? And what happens is you have the many chasing the few. Okay? You have uh, many herbivores uh, going after uh, less and less food. Their islands are shrinking because the type of food that they eat okay, is disappearing. Okay? In the case of the for example, mammal-like reptiles of the Permian and even the Triassic, the Archosaurs. Well, what happened? They, they ate ferns, specifically seed ferns. Okay? And their foods not only were, had, were dying because of thousands and really millions of years of inbreeding, those, those uh, plants finally ended up you know, uh, being all clones, and they were dying at the end. Lots of species were dying. And it's different when you have a radiation at the beginning of an epoch where you have these, like the ferns, you know, the first they radiated, there were many species and quantities of these uh, plants, and you had all these animals that were, you know, uh, uh, squatting niches. They say, oh, I'm going to take this one. Uh, the other guy said, I'm going to take that one. And they grew in relation to the varieties and numbers of seed ferns. But what happens towards the end? Well, after millions of years, they lose their genetic diversity. You have a population pyramid overturn of the plants, and now the animals they don't know it, but they're multiplying, and here the plants are shrinking on them. In other words, the, the uh, jungles and forests are becoming, uh, I call it the shrinking island, you know, because the islands, their islands of uh, food are shrinking while they are expanding, and at some point there is a crisis, and that's when they die. Parallel to that, what's happening is uh, a new type of food source is appearing. In this case, it was the conifers that were expanding. We're also crowding them out as, as the ferns were dying, the conifers were growing, and you have all these tiny animals that are growing with the conifers. We eventually called them the dinosaurs. They were in the background. They were all these little ants at the f feet of the big um, archosaurs. By that time, it was the archosaurs, the Triassic. And as the big animals finally died, the little guys expanded, and they took over the land. They expanded with the conifers, cycads first, and then eventually other conifers. And by the time you get to the Cretaceous, you get the same situation. Now the plants are dying, their islands are shrinking. What's taking over? The angiosperms. And guess who grew with the angiosperms? It was us, the mammals. 
okay? And that's essentially the theory, okay? So again, all I can say is people say I should take Extinction 101, make sure you understand that well. If you don't agree, well, all you, all you have to do is propose an alternative theory. Give me a mechanism uh, that is foolproof. And what I mean by foolproof is that full and full, both full and foolproof. It's got to be both, right? Why? What are we talking about? Well, we're saying that uh, you got to come up with an, a, an extinction mechanism that man cannot do anything about. Okay? Now, you say, well, they throw the bombs at each other. Well, we can do something about that. We just don't throw the bombs. And, uh, well, we can we have, have an asteroid coming towards the Earth. Well, we can nuke it maybe and turn it into a bunch of pebbles. That certainly won't break the Earth in half. Volcanoes, can we do something about that? Well, unless there's a volcano that cracks open the Earth. You know, uh, I think we can do a lot about volcanoes. I don't think we have to worry about volcanoes. Supernovas? I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, so, so they come up with all these theories. You know, some, some out, outrageous ones like egg predation. What the hell is egg predation? <laughs> how do you do egg predation under the sea? You know, I mean, we have to find out how the animals in the sea died as well. And then you have to, the, the only issue, you know, that you have to solve with extinction is selectivity. How one species survives and the other one dies, both plants and animals. If you can't do that, well, you got a problem. And especially, to go into a little more detail, it's got to be chronological selectivity. Because what's always died were the old ones. And what survived were the new plants. You know, the, the uh, 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 ferns, they were the old plants when you compare them against the conifers. And the conifers were the old plants when you compare them with, against the angiosperms. And that's the way it works. And same with the animals, by the way. You know, when did the dinosaurs start? When did the mammals start? Well, you find out that they were not, they were staggered. They were not, they didn't all start at the same time. And so again, uh, it's chronological selectivity that you got to explain. I'm not sure an asteroid can explain chronological selectivity. Neither can all this nonsense about methane coming out of the ground in the Permian and all these other studies that all these great, uh, uh, you know, scientists, scientists come up with. Yeah, they've got all these irrational theories. And so, yeah, uh, first got to do Extinction 101. You got to make sure you understand that well and that you can, you know, come up with a theory that is full and foolproof. And then, yeah, then you, you're allowed to talk about humans, whether we're going to become extinct, okay? And I'm saying that the reason humans are going to come, become extinct has nothing to do, again, with resources. It has to do with economics, okay? A mass extinction, above all, is an economic collapse. All animals do economics, and they have always done so. What is economics? It's the management of resources. What is the resource all, man, all animals manage? Food. That's their daily task. They manage food. The lion goes out there, he manages food. The cow goes out there, manages food. Even the ants go out there and manage food. Every animal has an economic system. When that economic system collapses, that species collapses. And if it's, you know, widespread, well, we call it a mass extinction. And in the case of man, it's not going to be resources. We, we've got resources to last us for a long time. Because, you know, right now our economic system is going to beat that by a mile. Our economic system is going to collapse because it's a, an inverted pyramid scheme. All corporations expect to sell more next year. And what does more mean? It means demand. What does demand mean? What is demand? Population. So, yeah, population driven, but nothing to do with resources, but to do with our economic system, man's artificial economic system. We have a system that's dependent on demand. There's got to be a pull. It's a, it's a bootstrap mechanism. You pull on your bootstraps and lift yourself up. That's how our economic system works. And what we're doing is, you know, we, we have to have more population always uh, demanding more products. In fact, I could solve all the problems on Earth very easily. If we could have the Klingons, right, one trillion of them, and, or the Martians, one trillion Martians suddenly put orders to Earth and say, we need all your products. We need your food, we need your television sets, your cars, your ships, your, your services. We would be out of a mess. We would have, you know, we had a trillion uh, people out there, you know, uh, buyers, uh, demanders, uh, demanding our products, we would be in good shape because suddenly you, everybody would, all the factories would be put to work. There'd be lots of uh, jobs. Uh, corporations would be steaming hot. And the problem we have today is that we're saturated. We, you know, everybody's already got all the manufacturing products that we need. 
you know, everybody's got first a house, more or less, a, a roof over his head. Uh, everybody's got a, you know, a refrigerator, an oven, uh, a washing machine. You replace them, what, every 10 years, whatever. So we don't need those products uh, like we did when they were first invented. You know, when those uh, items were invented, we needed, we, you know, very few people could have them because very few people could pay for them. Well, the prices came down, everybody started having them, companies made their profits, they move on to other products, and today we all have these things, more or less. And so the question is, yeah, we have all these products, so manufacturing now has died. We don't need manufacturing. In fact, someone asked a question about that, I'll get to, in the, to that in a second. Uh, manufacturing, has manufacturing died on the planet? Well, it's dying. You know, uh, big uh, companies, uh, I'm sorry, big countries, such as the United States, uh, com countries in here in Europe, you know, 80%, 85% of their economics, uh, their GDP, right, is um, services. Ma manufacturing is anywhere from 14 to maybe 20%, and agriculture is anywhere, somewhere around 1%, 1 to 2%. That's it. So we don't do ma agriculture anymore because we're so efficient at it that we don't need people, and it's not a big portion of GDP. Manufacturing, same thing. Not a big portion of GDP or of labor. Labor is all in services today. And even within labor, even within services, I mean, we're moving from hands type labor uh, uh, services, you know, haircutting and uh, landscaping, you know, where you use your hands, uh, to we're moving to internet services, you know, leisure, entertainment. We're all in the entertainment business. And so people are moving into that. Everybody wants to hit it big. So everybody says, oh, I'm going to start a YouTube site and collect money on ads. And everybody's moving in that direction. And what do you need for that? You need programmers. Again, people moving in that direction. Data, you know, people who put data in the system and so on. So we're going into this abstract world. And uh, like I say, you know, that's unemployment, masked unemployment. Why is it masked? Because you're not really doing anything. What you're doing is passing money around. I give you your salary. You go out there and give it to someone else. And that guy gives it to someone else. As long as you do just services. The only time it becomes productive where you have growth is where all that money turns into something tangible. You know, you got God and yourself up there looking at the earth. Okay, what do you see? How do you determine growth, real growth? Well, you look at buildings, you look at uh, highways, you look at bridges, you look at uh, the things that you can see, uh, you know, uh, boats and cars and even, uh, you know, uh, fields of corn and so on. Do you see the services? Do you see the promises, the contracts? Do you see your insurance? Do you see your banking account? Absolutely not. There's no such thing. Do you see Bitcoin? No, you don't see Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin is just a number in a computer. And like I said the other day, as soon as the Russians go out there and knock those satellites out, we have no internet and that's the end of money because all money is on the internet. Anyways, long story. The point is what's going to collapse is our economic system. When it does, not if, but when it does, no one has any incentive to produce food. What do we die of? Food, lack of food, starvation. That's that's where most of the people probably die of. But then, you know, after that, we will probably have fireworks. Uh, we'll have the nukes being thrown uh, from the Russians to the United States, the United States to China and so on. There's going to be great fireworks. So please stay out at night with your popcorn bag, you know, and watch them. <laughs> so that's going to be just an added uh, point. So it's going to be a ma mixture of starvation together with nuclear weapons. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think that's coming up very quickly. Uh, I can't even, could be months, could be years, I don't know. I can't tell you, I'm not an astrologer. All I can tell you is, I don't see how we can get out of it. And that is a foolproof mechanism because our system will collapse. We cannot grow forever. 